Colin Griffin, welcome to the Pace of Performance podcast. It's good to see you. Thank you, Rob. Um, great to be on. Um, yeah, like I've been a big, big follower of your podcast for a good number of years now, so delighted to be to be uh, to be on it and uh, hopefully have a, a good conversation. Absolutely. Just reminiscing that it was nearly now, well, it's nearly nine years since starting the podcast. So, no, well, thank you very much yeah. for that. Appreciate that. Um, so it's great to get you on. We're going to use, like I've done with a couple of people recently, actually, use the article that you published on Sportsmith as a bit of a foundation for the chat, and we'll delve a little bit deeper into some of the some of the exercises, some of the principles, some of the thoughts, theory behind behind that article in the podcast. So really looking forward to having a little chat. Calf strength, foot strength, all the kind of Achilles uh, rehab, all the kind of good stuff. So just before I do dive into that, would you mind just giving us a bit of a, a bio on you? Yeah, sure. Um, I suppose I begin with the present. Um, I work in the sports surgery clinic in Dublin. Um, I'm a strength and conditioning coach by, by trade and uh, the clinical lead for foot and ankle rehabilitation stream uh, in our sports medicine department. So our, our department kind of works in, in sort of rehab streams for different areas. Um, so yeah, look, I've been working there for the last uh, nearly nine years, eight and a half years. I don't know where the time has gone. So it's been a quite a steep learning curve. Um, worked with some great people, I suppose, past and present. And um, yeah, it's, it's been, been, been a great environment and, and I suppose made a lot of good connections outside of my work as well. Um, stemming back a little bit, I grew up in, in a sporting household. Um, both my parents were involved in athletics. My mum was an international runner. Um, my dad was more into the coaching and admin side of things. So that was the environment I grew up in. Um, so from my earliest childhood memories were, were going to watch my mother compete in races. Um, you know, she was quite close to qualified for Olympic Games. You know, so she, she operated on, on quite a high level. Did a lot of innovative, innovative things in her time, you know, like plyometric training, altitude training and all that. Um, so that was, I, I suppose, a very early exposure to that. Um, my dad then, he was um, director of coaching for Athletics Ireland, as it was uh, as it's known now, back in the 60s and early 70s. And he was team coach for the Olympic Games in 72 and 1980, and then went on to become president of our federation um, in the early 90s. So there was plenty of like, coaching manuals lying around the house, plenty of magazines, plenty of videos. So I was kind of getting immersed in that at, at, at a young age. So as well as being an athlete, um, which was hard to avoid in, in that environment, I was also a, a student of the sport. And... Yeah, look, with support of my parents uh, and, and, and a wider family, enjoyed a, a, a quite a fulfilling athletics career. Um, competed internationally, junior level up to senior level and, and two Olympic Games. Um, and I would say, like, I, I wasn't the most technically gifted at least. Um, I had to work hard to try and acquire technical mastery, um, even though I competed in, in a technical event. So um, and that, I suppose, led me down, gave me, I suppose, the curiosity for human movement, um, whether it was trying to sort injuries, whether it was trying to improve technique or biomechanics, and I suppose getting a passion for I suppose the work I'm doing now, and definitely fortunate to work with um, a lot of good practitioners, physios, S and C coaches, sports scientists in my own time as an athlete who were quite helpful to me, and and also I suppose to connect with people too um, as I as I, I suppose transitioned into my my professional career. Um, so really I retired from elite sport in, in 2013, um, probably having I'd say underachieved, but I, but at the same time I had my chances and opportunities and. I probably gave as much as I could to the sport and, and to my career, and I suppose at the stage, that stage, I had, I suppose, other career and family decisions to, uh, to, 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 uh, um, weigh up. Wow, I knew you'd competed, but why did I not know that you'd competed at Olympic Games? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, it's that. a long time ago now. It's, it's, uh, Just tell more people like, about it, Colin. <laughs> it's, 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 it's going it's out there. Like it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah. it's a very old chapter in my, in my. Uh, <laughs> At this stage, but um, yeah, no, great experiences, and, and look, at it, I'm, I'm very fortunate for um the opportunities I had in the sports. Like I did, I, my uh, I, um my event was a 50k walk, so as I said, a technical event, you're um you know it's judged strictly enough, and a bit like refereeing, um quite subjective, and you know I was disqualified actually in both Olympic games. Um, London was pretty particularly difficult because I was actually in really good shape. I was competing for a top 16 position and on course for big TB and, and, and got my third red card just before the 40k mark. So, um, so look, all those things, I suppose, you know, gave me the, I suppose, the curiosity and, and, and the hunger to try and um, understand movement better, understand biomechanics and try to problem solve better. And I suppose what I couldn't do for myself, I hopefully can help, I suppose, try and do for others that I'm fortunate to work with. Interesting. So where did your interest in lower limb come from because that's the way you've gone for your phd and that's what we'll chat around today why why that area particularly yeah so when i started working in the clinic um i was kind of um 
dealing a lot with, with running injuries and a lot of her running injuries are lower limb. Um, so I think from the hip and particularly the knee down to the ankle and, and, and foot. And we saw a lot of um, calf injuries and not all of them are calf strains. Some of them are, are kind of like exertional pain injuries, like basically an overload to, to a muscle that has probably poor capacity. Um, saw a lot of Achilles tendon off with these quite early on and um, sort of taking a few on um, and sort of took an interest in the area, got some good outcomes and um, definitely, I suppose, realised I need to learn a lot more about it. And over the, I suppose, subsequent few years, developed a bit of an interest, a research interest in it and developed a few research questions and um, I suppose to the point where I undertook a PhD in the area and hopefully now coming to, to the end of it in the next uh, two months. I spoke to Phil Glasgow. Um, have you you've come across Phil? I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I know Phil well. Um, yeah. 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 Good. I thought you must do. Um, and he was talking about in in the podcast that I did with him a couple of weeks ago that this, this transition in certainly in his environment from lots and lots of hamstring injuries two, three, four years ago. Obviously, lots of research in the area, but that seems to be they them injuries now seem to manifest in in the calf and Achilles issue into calf and Achilles issues. Is that something that you're seeing? And if so, do you think that's is there any particular reason for that? Yeah, I think as Phil was referring to the um, as was incidents of of, of 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 higher incidence of calf injuries that seem to have mm. now caught up or surpassed the the, the, the incidence of hamstring injuries in in, in rugby, particularly in the in the Irish rugby setup um, among the national sides and, and provincial sides. Um, I think actually I was listening to the podcast and Phil made a very relevant point about um perhaps the lack of exposure to, I suppose, a certain volume of running might be just predisposing the calf to, I suppose, having poor capacity and, and maybe a, a higher risk of those type of injuries. Um, because we know that the calf and the soleus, um, the, you know, they, they operate at quite a high capacity, of, uh, high, high proportion of their, of their muscle capacity or force capacity at even, you know, slow to moderate speeds. And um, yeah, I suppose the shift in the last 10 years towards, um, you know, high intensity interval training as a means to almost cheat the aerobic system into getting fit quite quickly, and and that um, it just you know it, it just might be under exposing the calf, the musculoskeletal demands, um of 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 those sports, even field sports where there's a lot of time on your feet, even though maybe a low percentage of it might be high speed running or moderate speed running, but you know the time on your feet does add up, and and those lower limb muscles, particularly the calf, are they're always on, so I think um that might be part of it, um and I suppose traditionally S and C programs haven't really focus deliberately on the on, on, on the, the calf muscles you know um a, a, in terms of strengthening them and, and developing capacity um and maybe relied on, on a lot maybe more in plyos and other exercises to, to develop that and, and which you do but for some athletes or players that mightn't be enough and they may need that little bit of deliberate exposure for you know six to twelve week blocks in, in the preseason or, or certain times of the year so just keep stay on this area stay on the calf and again re- referencing the article assessments what assessments can we do to identify whether this is an area that needs uh needs additional focus yeah and i suppose in the last um you know a couple of years with, with i suppose the more the easy access to fourth play technology and, and i suppose becoming more affordable to a lot of um clinics and clubs and organizations and universities um it's probably easier now to start standardizing calf tests particularly see the calf isometric uh, test so that's one that we use um and obviously when we bend the knee close to 90 degrees we're, we're isolating the soleus a little bit more um because as, as we know the, the gastroc muscles cross the knee joint so when you bend the knee we're making those muscles shorter and they're uh and and, and a little bit more redundant um so that's one way of, of assessing um calf strengths particularly for the soleus which again is quite important for field sports um and even you know in, in sprinting where the, during the acceleration part of it where the soleus is a big player and also for distance running as well, um, because the soleus is a big support for the center of mass. Um, and as I said, operates at quite a high capacity. So that's probably one test that, that can be standardized across uh, many areas. And again, there's a little bit of uh, inconsistency, I suppose, in terms of knee angle and levels of ankle dorsiflexion um, you might set up with. And um, so I suppose a few areas there that probably just need to be um, fleshed out a bit more. And then I suppose to get a measure of total plantar flexor peak, uh, peak torque or peak force, um, we use a uh, an isokinetic test um lying in a prone position so face down legs straight um at a speed of 30 degrees a second um working from 30 degrees plantar flexion to 10, 20 degrees dorsiflexion um and measuring peak torque and we kind of scale that to body weight and say for distance runners we'd like to be you know 150 160 percent body weight and above and for our 
um, sprint athletes being getting close to 200% body weight. We don't get many hitting that, but that's, I suppose, from the numbers we've, 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 we've collected over the years, that's sort of the targets we, we try and set based on um, uninjured athletes we work with and also fully rehabilitated athletes that we've, we've managed to progress up to, up to that. Um, but obviously, not everyone has an isocardic dynamometer, so um, you can do the uh, even a, a straight leg, standing straight leg isometric test with the force plates, um, you know, which is part of um, some of Alex Natera's work. Um, the challenge there, I think Alex actually found a solution for that by actually using a block where you can, because when you stand on, on the force plates, um, it's still a compound movement, so it's hard not to involve the knee extensors and hip extensors. And you don't know how much of that is coming from the plantar flexors. So when you use a block and get your alignment right and get more leverage through the ankle, um, you can probably get a, a better reflection of the of the of the calf um contribution to to, to peak vertical force. Um and again as, as a as suppose a surrogate measure of, of, of total uh, plantar flexor or calf force. So those are the two sort of strength tests or, or um that we would we would look at. And then we'd also look at developing uh, or look at assessing capacity, whether it's doing um even on the isokinetic um, dynamometer, Seth Neil had a, a good test that he validated during his PhD where you just do uh, 20 reps um, and measure total work done as a measure of calf capacity or in a very, very basic clinical setting, do like a heel raise endurance test where you work off a metronome of one second up, one second down, trying to have consistency of height, consistency of tempo, good control of the rear foot. And when either of those diminish, you stop them. And if they can get to 30 reps before that happens, that's a good measure of calf capacity. Um, maybe minimum 25 uh, and if they're below that then there's probably that they probably need to work on their capacity and you use that then to to to, to uh to uh, set your programming would you mind just just describing that seated isometric test for uh, as for, for us again Colin? yeah yeah i mean uh, yeah, so there's a there's a, um I have a picture of it in in, in the article um but, there is yeah but you know to talk through it like yeah so we, we sit we sit them with the knee around um so the knee sort of over the, the, the shoelaces um, in about, I kind of go for 10 to 15 degrees dorsiflexion. Um, I think you need some bit of dorsiflexion to get a, a proper measure of, of a peak force in the soleus. It, it does, um, you know, you need a little bit of length in the muscle tendon unit to get that. Um, and then have the, the knee around, you know, 90 degrees uh, knee flexion. Um, and then have the base of the first metatarsal on the block. Um, and then just uh, and then we use ratchet strapping to, to strap the knee down so there's very little slack in the system um so we just make sure that we, we give them a few familiarization trials and if there's any any loosening of or any um loss of tension in, in, in the ratchet we just tighten it again so that when they when they do their their their, their test trials it's good and tight and they're able to maintain their dorsiflex ankle position and we would go for three trial three um reps of a five second maximal isometric effort and take the best out of the three and it's the four foot on the block with the block on four the, foot yeah four. From, from yeah from, yeah from the base of the first metatarsal upwards um yeah and then the block obviously block on a fast plate yes so yeah exactly yeah, yeah. so we weigh the okay. we, yeah we weigh the block on the we're the fourth bits with the block on them and, and uh calibrate from that yeah it's interesting because um phil mentioned the them using this as a, as a test as a monitoring tool not only for capacity but monitoring fatigue in this in this particular area because of the rise in in uh, calf and Achilles issues in in Irish rugby, well, rugby as a whole, but Irish rugby in his environment. So, yeah, kind of feeds into that discussion as well. Yeah, and it, and it's when you get into a flow, like it's actually quite a quick and easy test to administer. You know, you can be done in ten minutes, and it's not that invasive. Like you, you know, yes, you're working hard for those few seconds at a time, but the soleus is a is a it's predominantly type one fiber muscle, so it's going to recover quite quickly, um, and you can go on about your business for the rest of the day. So, and I'll, and I suppose if you are in, in an environment like in a professional sport. Um, where you can do that on a weekly basis or or, or whatever, um, you know, you, you can it can be a quick test to do on a Monday morning, and you know, if someone's a, you know, a little bit off where they normally are, where the baseline levels are, it might be then a a, a, a flag then to, to to monitor their or to adjust their training loads for that given day or, or week. So we've taken our athlete through this testing battery. We've identified that things are lower than they should than we want them to be. Next stage is obviously strengthening that particular area. I'm guessing that. The vast majority of practitioners out there, if they're doing this kind of training, it'll be calf raises, either seated or standing. What other opportunities have we got to strengthen this particular area? Um, ideally, um, a Smith machine or a leg press, you know, where you can really go heavy on the calf, on the calf and isolate it um, and be quite stable, um, which is it's kind of hard to replicate that with a free bar. Um, or an, and it's quite hard to hold a heavy dumbbell um, if you want to go really, really heavy. Um, 
So I suppose if you have access to, to those, there's a lot you can do. You know, you can do quite heavy concentric, eccentric, or go heavy isometric for the short repeated, repeated holes, or you can go like your, your super max, supra maximal eccentric. Um, but again, you really you need your your leg press or uh, and or, or Smith machine for that. Um, but if if okay, if someone comes in with a low baseline, you know, we just do some basic stuff, maybe like sets of eight to twelve, four sets of eight to twelve reps, you know, with a, with a two rep in reserve sort of um, uh, loading guide, you know, just work the cap to fatigue. They're going to get they're going to get better with, with that anyway for a start, and then it's where do you go next? Um, and that might that should develop calf capacity. Sometimes, you know, and again, you might just pick up this visually. Um, they might be lacking. Um, they might have some atrophy to either their medial or lateral gastroc on one side or both sides, or there might be. <laughs> it could be an atrophy to medial gastroc on one side and their lateral on the other side. But a few cases of that, so you can manipulate foot position to try and um, uh, bias those muscles, that particular those particular muscle heads, um, and work it work it to to fatigue and into length to try and get those hypertrophy um changes and 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 and, and I suppose balance the strength a bit more across all three. Um, so yeah, um, they will be the, I suppose the main, uh, the main exercise types. Um, again, if we have to target the soleus, uh, yeah, we do some isolated stuff with, with an event. So either a very, very heavy kettlebell or else, um, spit machine, or ideally if you've got a CD calf machine, you can go really heavy and be quite stable. Um, and again, with the soleus, given the, the physiology of the muscle, um, you know, you can still make good, good strength changes, um, even working to endurance off moderate load. So you can still, if you just make the muscle tired, it's going to get stronger anyway, um, to a point. And then it's like, you, know, you might get to a point then where you hit a ceiling where you may need to go really, really heavy for, for, for low volume to, to, to increase the force capacity even further. Um, but, it but it just depends. Come on. No, you're okay. And no, I'm just saying you use your, your tests, um, your straight leg and your bent knee, your, your seated, um, calf test to you know if you see the calf test is quite good in proportion to your straight leg one well then we might need to worry too much about the solace unless maybe in field sports uh, field sports where acceleration is quite important and you are going to use the solace a little bit more in isolation and um, particularly in the early to mid stance of an acceleration or a jump or a horizontal some sort of a horizontal effort and um, i think it's useful to, to do that and, and, and train it as i mentioned in the article in synergies with the foot and and, and, and with hip extension but say for a distance runner um you know, if, if the soleus is quite good and you test it um, and there's maybe room to improve their overall calf strength, well, then we just go straight leg and, and, and keep it simple. Um, because again, time and energy resources are going to be valuable to, well, most athletes, but particularly endurance athletes when you're you're always going to be tired anyway, no matter um, when you try to do an SNC or rehab session. We'll get onto the foot in a second, but just one last thing. Would you be looking for a particular ratio between this, um, the isolated soleus and the general calf complex test? Yeah, it's hard to because in our in in our clinic we're comparing a seated, you'd be comparing a seated calf isometric with a with a, a straight leg isokinetic test. So, yes. in fact, what, I suppose through coincidence, the numbers are actually similar. We look for about for a distance runner, maybe at least I would even say now, like then we test a lot more and and, and we're more we're more more robust with our with our protocols. We're getting higher numbers now because they're more stable in those positions. So we've seen more people hit twice body weight. And more people, and, and maybe more sprint or explosive athletes getting, you know, two point two tons body weight. So, in the article, I would have said back then one point six and maybe twice body weight for distance runners and, and, and maybe sprint athletes respectively. But now we kind of thinking maybe one point eight and ideally twice body weight for a distance runner who wants to compete at a decent level, and maybe two point two and above for your your sprinter athlete or field sport player. Um, so yeah, it's hard to say there's a proportion when you're when you're comparing an isometric with an isokinetic test. Um, so but again for the isokinetic test. Um, straight leg, we're looking at um, you know, one hundred sixty percent body weight for your distance athletes, and maybe close to two hundred percent body weight for our um explosive athletes, and then we're also able to run a a code um to look at torque at different ranges. So someone might might have good peak torque, um, but they may have bigger symmetries in either slightly counterflexed angles or slightly dorsiflexed angles, and we can um focus on on on, on I suppose joint angle specific um strength changes based on that. I don't want to bring it down to my level, but I'm sure there's people out there. Just explain explain that a little bit more for us, the peak talk. Yeah. So um yeah, so basically like it's like the turning force um you you're you're producing. Um so it takes into account the the, the, the ankle um the, the, the moment arm. So uh as well as the force you're producing. So um we scale peak torque to body weight. So we divided the torque in newton meters by your body weight. So and again we're seeing good numbers. In the sort of high hundreds, so one hundred and fifty to two hundred percent body weight across the board, and we just kind of break it down a little bit more to sprint athletes uh, and maybe field sport players versus 
for your distance runners. Um, but again, we, we do see a bit of a hybrid of, 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 you know, we see some people you'd expect big numbers from coming in at maybe 120% body weight and maybe skinny distance runners coming in at close to 200% body weight. So there's a little bit of a hybrid with that as well. But anyway, um, so we measure peak torque, um, which usually happens in, in slight length. So it usually happens somewhere between zero degrees or neutral ankle, maybe between that and, and maybe 10 degrees dorsiflexion. Obviously, you need a bit of length to produce your, your peak force or peak torque. And then we measure torque at 20 degrees plantar flexion and 10 degrees dorsiflexion. So particularly for someone who's had an Achilles rupture, where they're going to be weak in, in inner range plantar flexion, we see big deficits there and that takes a long time to to um, to address and, and, and reverse. And I suppose you, can, you probably only get so far with that. Other cases, you might see someone who's quite weak in at more dorsiflex angles. Um, so 10 degrees dorsiflexion, there might have maybe a 20% difference, even though the peak torque might look symmetrical. So we can use that, those findings to get someone, if it's, a, if it's an inner range plantar flexion deficit, do some inner range isometric work um, and load them there to try and strengthen in that area. Or if it's a dorsiflexion, uh, a dorsiflex angle deficit, um, you know, work them into, into length, into, into a sort of an eccentric loading um, scheme or else uh, do some long length isometric holes to, to get them stronger at that angle. I hope that makes sense. You know, yeah, I'm following. I'm, 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 I think I am I'm following. <laughs> no, thanks, mate. Appreciate that. So you, you you mentioned you mentioned foot strength. I think this is a really interesting area. How are we assessing whether we need to isolate or have that isolated type of training in our program, or should it be across yeah, the board, I, even without any yeah. assessment? Um, yeah, no. I mean, it is quite important, and it's not something that has been done um, traditionally outside of, say, a clinic, a clinic environment. So um, it's not something that's, that's I suppose typically done in snc program um obviously i see a lot of feet um and look i mean i've, I've, I've there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of um i've had a lot of good practitioners that i network with and, and, and who specialize in foot area that i bounce ideas off and you know as so we, we get when we kind of talk back and forth i suppose uh good ideas can emerge from that so um yes yeah, so what i've done is developed it or i suppose um developed a test with a handheld dynamometer um where if you um test them in with a slight dorsiflexed an- a- ankle angle and dorsiflexion of the first MTP joint. So the big toe joints that literally lift the big toe up. Uh, so they're at a long length. You're getting a measure of their flexor lucis longus, which is quite a, one of the important extrinsic foot muscles that, that um, has a role to play in terms of inner, um, a, a toe off. Um, and then we would do the same thing with more of a plantar flex angle to get a measure of the intrinsic foot muscles. Um, so we're making the flexor release as long as short and a little bit insufficient. So we're getting more isolated measure of the intrinsic foot muscles, which are actually quite important. And they have a big role to play in coordination with the foot, to stiffen the foot at the right time um, for propulsion of toe off, you know, so particularly for acceleration, for jumping, you know, the particularly um, the, the, the muscles across the big toe are, 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 are have, a, have quite a significant, small but significant contribution to, to, to those type of to performance. Um, you know, in, in sprint and, and, and jumping and, and, and push off uh, positions. Um, so there's three key muscles that cross the big toe joint here, your flexor hallucis brevis, your ab- adductor and abductor hallucis, um, which are, you know, as foot muscles go, they're, they're quite big volume and, and a big physiological cross-section area. So when we measure toe flexor strength, we're getting a measure of, of the force output of those muscles in particular. So do you think it is something, I think it's, let me rephrase that. It is something that you see pop up every now and again on social media and it gets a lot of, it normally gets a lot of hype because it's relatively novel. People don't, you don't see it a lot, but should people, given the time pressures of people like yourself or pre-2013 Colin with, with training team sport athletes who are getting a minimum time in the, in the gym to develop all these different things, but should do you, in your opinion, should practitioners be focusing on this particular area more than they are? Yes, at least, you know, screen for it. And if someone is weak in that area and they have a history of lower limb injuries, you know, I think it's an obvious low hanging fruit to try and address. Um, you know, if you've had a history of recurrent foot or ankle injuries or even calf injuries. Um, yeah, I think it's quite an important area to, 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 to look at. Doesn't take that long to assess. You can even, you know, if you're, if you're, you know, if you have enough experience, clinic experience behind you, or even just practical experience, you can get a manual feel of the toe flexor strength. A lot of the time, it's just muscle inhibition. They, they are those muscles are quite uh, prone to inhibition for different reasons. Um, you know, so uh, oftentimes I just build in some foot foot exercises, more of an activation into the warm up, 
Um, so you've got better contribution of those muscles in, in, in those bigger sort of compound movements. Um, sometimes you might, might use um, neuromuscular re-stimulation to, to, to try and increase the activation of those muscles. Um, so yeah, look, I think it's just been an overlooked area and I suppose it's starting to, with the help of some good research that's come out of a couple of um, labs across the world, particularly um, in Queensland, Australia, Luke Kelly and his team have done a lot of good work on, on, on foot research. And, and I suppose traditionally, um, you know, we would have always thought that what they call the windlass mechanism. So when you dorsiflex the big toe, that stiffens the arch and stiffens the foot. So it's more of a, um, you know, it passively stiffens it. But thank you know with, with, with the I suppose that the the um I suppose the emerging research from 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 the from from the group I mentioned um you know the the, the actual cor the activation of the foot muscles are, are, are probably more important are, are probably the big players in terms of stiffening the foot at the right time particularly in, in toe off um and the wind wind last mechanism is, is 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 certainly plays a role but it's probably not the it's not the deal breaker um so definitely important that, that we have good foot strength and be able to activate it at the right time during the gets like particularly as we as we go to toe off i think jb jb mamrin's got a phd student or a couple of phd students in this area as well yeah he? yeah roman turlan yeah we, we actually That's got regularly one. so we watch out for him he has some really good work in the next couple of years when he uh gets towards the latter stage of his phd i'm pesting the life out of him for a for an article on this area he's gonna i think he's gonna put oh, it together yeah. <laughs> in a couple of, in a he couple will. of months so uh yeah, yeah. We're, we're looking forward to that i think it's a, a super interesting area so we've gone through that assessment how are we training it? Yeah, uh, I mean, I have a simple go-to, like just doing some um, band-resisted big toe curls, um, just getting the foot set up with the big toe joint on the block and the rest of the toe hanging off it. Um, and maybe bringing it into a little bit of plantar flexion so you're taking out the contribution from the, the tib tibialis anterior, your anterior shin muscle. Um, and you can, you know, start off with it with the foot flat, but just with the knee sort of sitting behind the ankle to be slightly plantar flexed. And then you can actually just do an active heel raise um, to really activate or maximize the, the activation of, of those foot intrinsic muscles. And you want to feel like a, a burning or a cramping sensation in the arch. Um, so we do that um, more so as an activation exercise. But like when, you, when you're doing single leg calf raises, um, particularly with shoes off, ideally, um, you know, at that sort of top position, if you do lift a short asymmetric hole in the top, you know, you're, you're getting good recruitment of the foot muscles anyway. Uh, and also tib post and, and your peroneals. So you're getting everything in that, in that one lift. So if someone is limited in that, in, in that particular movement or that particular position, we just work back from that. What's the limiting factor? Is, is it the lack of foot strength or recruitment that's, that's not allowing them to be stable there? Um, and if it is, we just we bring in those isolated exercises to to um, support them to, to get to that point. But look, well, you want to get to a point where that we can get a lot out of as few exercises as possible, you know, especially in the busy part of the season. So the um, last thing someone wants to do is spend an hour and a half or two hours, you know, doing a whole load of rehab exercises when there's, other demands on the time and on their, on their energy resources. Of course. So for someone that's quite well versed in this area and speaking to a lot of people in terms of the groups that we've mentioned, JB and the, the um, Queensland, did you say? Yeah. 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 What, what is, what do you think is coming down the line for this particular area in terms of research? Um, yeah, no, I think, I think what's come out in the last few years, I mean, there's been, there's been several papers, you know, since 2014 from Luke Kelly's group um, that have really, supposed to change people's thinking around this area. So, um, you know, I think there's a lot already already done. Um, I suppose it's just maybe being a bit cleaner or tidier with some of our ways of, of assessing foot strength and maybe coming up with some sort of solution with, with, with a force plate or a strain gauge where you can do it properly. Um, you know, handheld dynamometer, if I'm doing it myself all the time, I'm probably confident in my own reliability. But if someone else was to do what I was doing, it mightn't be very reliable. So... And it's, that's why it can be hard to compare numbers. Um, so maybe having some sort of a, you know, a, a cleaner solution might, might be better. And then I suppose just being, being a bit more creative with some of our exercises to, to target certain muscles in, in, the, in the foot. Um, you know, I, I still feel like I have a lot more I need to, to learn about the area. Um, I'm only scratching the surface. In the, in the article, just moving on from the, the foot stuff, and the, although I think that's super, super interesting and um, looking forward to getting uh, a piece on sports with about it. But, Back to the rehab, developing reactive strength during the return to play process. Interesting, probably second half of the article that, that you wrote, focus on this area and then developing explosive strength again during that uh, return to play process. So the reactive strength first, moving through a rehab, how can we understand how much emphasis we need to put on this particular phase during a particular rehab? So we can spend the time or 
or tick the box and kind of move on. Is there any, again, moving back to the assessments, is there any assessments that you would do to get, help you guide whether you need to spend that time on this particular area in terms of reactive strength? Yeah, well, like I think I think every at least uh, um, probably needs to spend time on this, um, and it probably should be the mainstay of, of of any sport that involves running or or some bit of impact or or, or, or um, reactivity. It, it should be nearly a um, a mainstay of the program. But in rehab, I think there's a key link between your your your, your gym based rehab stuff and your your return to sport, whether it's on the field or on the track or on the road, um, exposing the muscle tendon unit to those high um, high I suppose loading rate demands. Um, you know the the, the 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 fast stretch that the Achilles tendon has to has to accommodate, and um, the ability to coordinate around the around the ankle and the knee and the hip quite quickly, even preactivate before contact. So yeah, it's, it's quite important. You know, we, we we talk a lot about rate of force development, um, early versus late phase rate of force development, and more sports where there's reaction involved. You know, the your, your early phase, which is like the, how much you know the biggest change in force in those first fifty to hundred milliseconds, um, it, it's quite important. And you know, your ability to preactivate it's what you do before you hit the ground is actually quite important. Um, so you're relying a lot on preactivation of, of of the lower leg muscles and the elastic properties of of, of the of the Achilles tendon in particular. Um, so reactive strength is, is closely linked to that. Um, so yeah, so like it is quite important. Um, and I suppose just how you go about programming because you know you, you you take different clusters of athletes and they're all going to have different reactive strength profiles. Some are more you know like to use more ground and maybe spend a bit longer on it to get their impulse to to get good jump height. Whereas others are quick and springy. And maybe maybe you might need to try and get a bit higher with, with that same sort of uh, you know short contact time, and then you got to suppose the, the bits in between, um, you know, and then I suppose you work the spectrum of um, you know short contacts versus maybe slightly longer contacts, getting more impulse, and maybe working the contractile properties of the of the muscles a little bit more, um, and then maybe you know so I suppose as I mentioned in the article, um, and again purely from experience, and I suppose other people who have done a lot of pioneering work in this area, and some of them you, whom you've had on on, on your podcast, um. You know, starting off with just some basic coordination patterns, um, you know, and I have pushed a few exercises from from different people as you do, um, but like just doing basic pogo hops. I really like the, as I mentioned, the um the rudiment series that Altus and and um have 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 used and um Boot uh, Boot Schneider, um, I really like that as a as a way just to try and get some basic coordination patterns going, particularly people who are not as experienced with plyometrics, um, just getting their alignment between ankle, knee, and hip and shoulders. Um, minimizing the knee, the knee bend of contact, um, trying to get the active dorsiflexion when they come off the ground, um, and progressing onto, onto single leg and trying to keep those qualities going. And then when you've got a bit of a background behind you, then it's, it's you know where do you go then next? You know, do you intensify it or do you add more, um, more challenges or more, more complexity to it, or, or or go for a bit more volume or, or capacity work, um, you know, and and yes, yeah, so like you you would go into your, like your drop jumps, um, hurdle hops, and then. Particularly for calf and Achilles injuries or ankle injuries in general, I, I like to bring in like incline hopping, where it's up, up steps in a in a stadium, or it's up 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 a, up a hill or an incline, where you really kind of um, have to coordinate around the ankle better, um, and you're really sort of um, working on the on the contractile machinery of your of your, of your calf muscles as well. So, uh, and particularly coming back to those calf injuries, I think I think an exposure to that is, is quite useful. Um, as opposed to minimise the the risk of them breaking down again when they get back running at, at, at those sort of moderate to high volumes again. What kind of athlete were you, Colin? Were you in the spend a little bit more time on the ground to get the height, or were you more reactive? I was neither, so it's all good. Well, I was a race walker, so um, I, I never left the ground. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only only figuring it out now in the last ten years. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, but I, as a, as a transition runner now, like I've been running for the last uh, whatever since I retired from race walking, I've been running now and um, particularly over longer distances and. Um, uh, yeah, so actually, very funny story. I went to sidetrack side too much. I was over in, in, in Monaco for a conference back in 2017 at the IOC conference, and I was actually staying in Nice. And I just began working with JB Morin, who's my, my PhD supervisor. So I was staying in, in, in the South of Run along the promenade one morning. I heard someone just come up behind me in the car, you know, give me a, a, a beep, and I looked around at JB. And he was actually driving to Monaco or to Monaco to the conference. And then we met afterwards. And he goes, Yeah, do you know, I spotted you because uh, you run like a race walker. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Obviously not a good thing in his eyes. <laughs> yeah, but that was early days. But I've probably got a little bit bouncer since then. But um, yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, I did. I didn't realize he was. Well, I remember he did actually. But now I think about it, he was your PhD supervisor. He is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, okay. Um, yeah, because I'm, I'm 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 registered to University of Cote d'Azur, um, which is like a doctor school that takes in um, a university in Nice and Marseille, um, 
so yeah, so JB's my supervisor, although he's left, um, he, he's moved back to University of San Etienne since then, but that um, it doesn't change, uh, yeah, it doesn't change things for me, but yeah. How many times have you been out there? Um, maybe once or twice a year pre-pandemic, whereas now I suppose I'm able to manage things remotely. All my, all my work is done in, in Dublin, all my data collection is done in the, in the clinic, so um, everything else then can be done through through Zoom or whatever, so um, hopefully the next time I'm back there will be for my, my uh, PhD defence, and hopefully before the end of the year. It's beautiful out there, isn't it? Yeah, it's a lovely part of the country. Yeah, it's, it's so, uh, yeah, so. really nice, especially in the summer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so explosive strength. Moving on from reactive strength to explosive strength. Again, something you mentioned later on in the article. Assessments during the return to play process. How much time we need to spend on this? Are we just ticking the box? What what assessments would you run your athletes through to guide this next part of the return to play process? Yeah, I, I think even a simple thing like hopper distance, because um, you know we we know from some of the papers that came out of a group in Aspatar back in the last two years, um, and it was more focused on the the um, you know the usefulness or, or lack of for using a thing like hopper distance in ACL rehab, um, particularly during the propulsive phase, because there's there's probably a lot, lot less knee contribution during the propulsive phase, a lot more maybe during the landing phase where the knee is more of an absorber. Um, but from that, when, when they looked at the joint work contribution, there was, a, I suppose, the ankle and the hip are, contribute the most to, to, to um, the propulsive phase of, of a horizontal hop. And when you look at the muscle forces that they measure, the solaris is by far the biggest force contributor. So I think if you're doing a thing like hopper distance um, test, you're getting a good measure of um, explosive qualities from the, from the solaris muscle in, in particular, especially when you're going from a bent knee position because um, you have an accelerated center mass, um, which is a, uh, which the solaris is, is, is the has a big role in that um so that's probably one way um probably the i suppose the simplest way to do it uh, as an assessment um as part of my phd work i've tested the reliability and looked at some of the biomechanical features of a, of a single like horizontal rebound so it's like a, a i suppose a double single like hop so we hop out on the first bit and rebound for distance um, and we looked at a lot of variables like um and we we, we actually looked for i suppose trying to propose a which some have kind of touched on before i'm not saying we, we pioneered this but just trying to maybe strengthen the case for using a horizontal reactive strength index as a horizontal alternative to a, a vertical reactive strength index. So measuring rebound, dividing rebound distance by the contact time. Um, so we looked at, we, we, we looked at that um, we looked at um, leg vertical and joint stiffness. And we looked at uh, hip, knee and ankle joint power and joint work um, and, all, and the joint angle changes. And similar to the hopper distance um, paper um, in Aspatar, um, the ankle, um, you know, had the ankle and slightly, slightly lesser degree, the hip had, had the biggest contribution to to um, joint work and, and power. Um, and then the knee obviously had, had a lower contribution, but it was, but it had the highest, it was, it was the one joint that had the highest, higher stiffness than say the ankle or the hips. So, um, so yeah, any sort of horizontal um, jump um, will give you a good measure of lower limb explosive strength qualities. Um, and I mean, you will get it from vertical too, like so, something like a squat jump or a, um, current movement jump, you're probably getting a good measure of, of explosive qualities as well from from, from the from the lower limb, in particular the calf. So, um, yeah, I think either either or, and then there might be there might be some um, logic between using maybe one vertical and maybe one horizontal one, depending on the on the sport you're working with. Just the horizontal RSI, so hopping onto the force plate, and then mm-hmm. going for distance on the yeah. on the rebound. Okay. Yeah, and, and trying to, to minimise it as the ratio. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Is the has that got any? I know you said you're not. The, there's been other work before you in this area, but is that got more um, performance related information that could be taken on further by yourself or others? Uh, look, it's purely exploratory. I think I think it's something for it, it's it's um, something for someone to uh, to take up and maybe and maybe um, yeah uh, investigate further. Um, we don't have anything to, to correlate with those type of um, outcomes with with performance, but. Um, but again, if you're a jump athlete, you know, if you're a long jumper, triple jumper, um, I think for acceleration, um, I think there might be some, yeah, there might be some potential there to, 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 uh, think those qualities and, and use it as, as a measure of it. So return to play process, done the assessment, expose your strengths, the aim, where we're going with it to, to build this athlete back up to then back into, back into training. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, as soon as they can run, do some basic linear running, we, we bring it in, um, even if they're only at basic sort of plyometric level. But we want to make sure that the house is in order, you know, so that they're they're, they're quite 
um, proficient at the plyometric, they can handle a, a good amount of plyometric volume, um, single leg, multi-directional if, if we need to, if it's, if it's a field sport player, before we start to bring in some, um, you know, a phase of, of, of um, volume running. Because um, it's the return to run phase, particularly for calf injuries, um, where, where things can flare up again, you know, and, and there's always that risk of the of a calf injury because you're dealing even with the muscle injury, you're, it, it's primarily tendon tissue that's involved, and tendon tissue takes a lot longer to remodel, and um, so it's a bit of a long game, and you always have to. It's easy to if you if you're if you're just purely use symptoms as a guide, you can be pain free, you can be functionally well, but there's ongoing remodeling going on there in the background that you don't see, and that could be up to six months based on and once that you use and who who um who uh, retrospectively or who who um did did um. MRI follow-ups and in, in, in muscle injuries, so there, that that's you know, that's gone for several months. So if you have cut corners to get back playing or performing, and you've kind of backed off a little bit in your rehab, thinking you're out of the woods, um, you know you're still at a, you're at a very very high risk of a reoccurrence. Um, so so I think it's really important that we we um expose them to a good level of reactive strength work, and a level of volume running. So maybe it depends on the sport, obviously, but um, distance runners are going to build up their volume anyway. But for field sports, you know, maybe having exposure to um, a moderate amount of volume at a, at a you know moderate to high intensity, um, for a phase before we can be, um, I suppose comfortable returning them back to their to the, to, the, to competition. How how important is it to be super careful post calf injury, in that introduction back to running? Unlike something like a hamstring, where you get up to high speeds to to get into that danger zone. Yeah, calf, yeah. Is, you're in it straight away. It's almost like the reverse. So, like obviously, with a hamstring, you can probably get away with like low, low intensity, moderate intensity running. I mean, uh, again, without deviating too much, I had a hamstring injury before a marathon back three years ago, four weeks out, and it was a grade two B, so it was a myotendinous junction, um, bite the femoris, and I was quite aggressive with my rehab, and because I was rehabbing myself, and I was, I was willing to take risks, and if I didn't make the marathon, you know, it was no big, no big deal. It's a bonus if I could, but managed to get it resolved. Managed to run a PB that that, that day, but I know if I was a sprinter. I wouldn't have got away with it, and um, because I wouldn't have had it, I wouldn't have just been able to handle maximum speed running. But obviously, didn't have to in those final few weeks for a marathon. So yeah, uh, but for the calf injury, pretty solid. You can probably kind of go um, short to long with, with, with your progression. Maybe bring them, bring in some like short, not I would say sprints, but like maybe working eighty to ninety percent of their maximum velocity over you know fifty, sixty meter repeats. Um, they could probably handle that, and while you're trying to build capacity concurrently. Um, and then you can, I suppose, start to increase their volume, you know, uh, gradually over a, you know, a week or two. Um, so you can kind of go um, short to long with, with those calf injuries, whereas with hamstrings, you probably have to go sort of, you know, gradually slow to fast, um, you know, and making sure everything's in order before we bring in high speed running. Cool. And your PhD in the area of Achilles, Achilles rehab? Achilles rehab, yeah, and lower limb biomechanics. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So um, is there any coming towards the Sorry mate, coming towards the end? Yeah. Coming towards the end, yeah. So I'm, 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 I've I've one study to finish off and I'm writing my thesis at the moment. So hoping to have it submitted in the next uh, over the winter months and hopefully have it have my defence um before the end of the year. Um so yeah, it's been been a five year journey. Um so yeah, the the, the broad topic being Achilles rehab and lower limb biomechanics. Um so we we have um Couple of chapters in it, so um, two papers. Well, one, one paper would be the the horizontal rebound test that I mentioned, testing the reliability and looking at the biomechanical features of that, which we have a paper in, in submission at the moment, and then another reliability paper for CD calf isometric test that we're just about to finish uh, and get ready for submission. And then our main study would be a RCT um, on runners, uh, participants who, who who take part in sports that involve running. So it's not just distance running; it's it's field sports. So any sport that involves running. Um, who have chronic mid portion Achilles tendinopathy, so having symptoms more than three months, pain in 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 the, the mid portion of, of the tendon as as opposed to the run the heel insertion. Um so we we give them we, we, we randomize them into into one of two groups. Um so one program one group follows a program that we put together that's um based on two or three high intensity sessions a week, um multifactorial, so working on calf strength and um, plyometrics, um guiding the running, and then another group follows um a program that's kind of um by by um this is silvernagel pro- pro- protocol so karen silvernagel is a prominent um, tendon researcher based in the university of delaware and her protocol um it's kind of similar nature in that, in that it's 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 it, it, very, it has multi exercise types so you know um combined concentric eccentric and so on 
bring into play metrics, but probably a little less specific in terms of how you progress it. So it's kind of it's more kind of based on symptoms, whereas we're kind of hit certain strength targets um, to, to guide progression, um, at, at, you know, to a maximum level of tolerable pain as opposed to just relying on pain to, to progress. And we test them at the start and then at week six and week 12, and then we do long term questionnaire follow ups. So we look at the running mechanics and using 3D motion capture. And um, we test their calf strength, uh, either kinetically, straight leg and bent knee. And then we look at their vertical drop, jump, and single leg horizontal rebound. And um, so that's been a big study. And then I've also got a single case report that I'm preparing to submit um, on a, a, a football player in Ireland who sustained an Achilles rupture um, last springtime when, when, when inter county training. Um, resumed after after the restrictions so it was the first week back and he had a surgical repair so we we're able to collect some useful data on him over the nine months his nine month rehabilitation journey and also map out his, his rehabilitation so um so yeah there, there's four papers in, in that study or in, in that in that uh, in my thesis and that hopefully will be useful one last question biggest mistakes either you have made or others make when rehabbing uh, an Achilles? Ooh, yeah. Um... I've put it on the spot there. Sorry, mate. You have. You have. No, no, but <laughs> we all make mistakes. I've made mistakes. I'm just yeah, I, I think it's actually quite important because you know, so with, with, with tendons, it's it's not just the tissue. It's not just the the structural damage and what you see in MRI scan doesn't always match up to the pain response and all that, you know, there's a lot of other factors going on that we can't see. And it's very hard to quantify. Um, even the pain response that you get from Achilles tendon, a lot of that is just chemical noise in, in, in the tendon. So you've got the cells that react, you've got an inflammatory process. That's not the normal part of exercise. We get an inflammatory response and normally it resolves itself. And when the, when the inflammatory response kicks off, the, 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 the cells in, in the tendon, the tenocytes become active. And you've got that sort of um, battle between release of productive enzymes that, that break down tendon tissue and then the production of enzymes that help to repair it and then you've got your your your, your inflammatory mediators and then your inflammatory inflammation uh, resolving uh, mediators um and oftentimes what you have then when, when the tendon becomes more chronic you've got a, you've got an extra growth of blood vessels and the, normally the tendon itself the actual collagen t um fibers don't have much blood supply direct blood supply or or, or, or nerve supply Normally, the nerve and blood supply is on the periphery in, in, in that sort of synovial space. Um, but when you've got a chronic tendonopathy, that you, you get an extra ingrowth of blood vessels towards the, the, the core of the tendon. And then with that, you've got um, a sprouting of the, of the nerve endings. And those nerve endings are quite exposed. They're unmyelinated, so they're quite exposed to noise in the area. And they've just become sensitized to, to those sort of that chemical noise. And that's what kind of drives the pain. Um, so that's a tricky one. Um, and then you've got people, you know, you've, you've got, you know, there's a nice paper there by, uh, again, it was in, in, in Sean Hanlon last year, he's part of the Carrie Sibonagle's group in Delaware, where he categorized three different subgroups of, of, of patients who have Achilles tendinopathy, those who are more structure dominant. So that it's a, a pretty much like a mismatch between loading capacity and those who are more biopsychosocial dominant. So again, there's a lot of fears and, and catastrophic, uh, catastrophizing beliefs around, around, the, around the symptoms and that can um, increase the, I suppose, the sensitivity of the tissue and, and, and those nerve endings. And then maybe those who are more metabolic, which are probably the less sporty people um because the tendon can be sensitive to other things going on in the body so i think i suppose to get back to my main point one thing i've probably learned over the years is to try and understand what the patient thinks or the athlete thinks it's going on what, the, what their understanding of it is their process is um because a lot of them will fear that they're going to rupture and sometimes you know yes when you rupture there there probably is some pathology there that you might see and um, that might be um make them a little bit more vulnerable um but when you are sore you're probably not going to do things that are going to cause you to rupture like doing something fast and explosive so that that pain can be a little bit protective so trying to break down that barrier um but yeah just definitely trying to involve the patient a lot more and i suppose um that's one thing i've probably learned over the years try to understand what, what way they're thinking and if it's irrational try in, in in a very careful and sensitive way try to break that down and, and, and work, work through it love it sorry to put it on the spot there but dealt with like a true yeah. professional <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> but no Thank you for coming on, Colin. Well, if anyone wants to keep up to date on what you've got going on, PhD wise, other stuff going on, running, etc., where's the best place? Twitter, Instagram? Uh, both, yeah. I suppose I use Twitter a lot more for professional stuff. Um, it's been a, a good resource. Um, so, yeah, a lot of uh, 
a lot of good resources there. A lot of people actually like to, like to try and I suppose share ideas. And you know, it's, it's always a, it's a good tool too. And, and you're limited with, with, with characters in space to try and get your own post together concisely. And so try to use it for that purpose and, and, and share and, and, and I suppose learn from others and try and stay out of things I don't need to get involved in. Um, <laughs> so in Twitter, yeah, my handle is at Colin Griffin. I, I got in there good and early when I was able to get my you own did. name. <laughs> um, <laughs> have to add other characters to it. With the blue um, tick as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was from the Olympics, but yeah, yeah, yeah we all got yeah. that as a bonus back in, in, in London 2012. Did you Didn't actually? Look for it, but I got it, so. Was that what, was that just a thing that went, if you were in the Olympics, you yeah. got a blue tick in 2012? Yeah, right. that time, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I'll, I'll take it. Um, <laughs> so Twitter or, or, um, or LinkedIn as well, I often uh, use that, I suppose, for, more for professional stuff. But um, yeah, look, I mean, it works both ways. A lot of, I've... A lot of people have been very generous with their time to me over the years and I've learned a lot from them. And if someone comes to me with a question, I'm always trying to try to help them. And if I can't help them, try and point them in the right direction. So, uh, yeah, always happy to, for people to reach out. Awesome. Well, thank you for the last hour. Really appreciate your time. It's good to put a uh, face to a name and face to an email address and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, look forward to keeping in touch and we'll chat soon. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Rob. Thanks very much for having me on. It's been, been, Cheers, been good to chat. Thanks, mate.